Hi, my name's Bob Grinier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So, it's 2019, and Alexander Parkamov has a new gift for the community. So, something he's been working on uh, is an update of the multiety of nucleides arising in the process of cold nuclear transmutations... Uh, calculations and this time he's including uh, involving electrons. Now um, essentially last year uh, off his own uh, initiative he produced a data set uh, which he's uh, um, discussing here in the first part of this article. He says um, in Processes of cold nuclear transmutation, as experiments show, a certain set of stable nucleides passes into another set of stable nucleides with the release of energy. Neutrons or charged particles are not emitted outside, i.e. the total number of nucleons and the total electric charge remains unchanged. In order to identify fundamentally possible transmutation, transformations during such processes, it is not necessary to delve into the physical mechanisms of the cold nuclear transmutation, you can put them in a black box. So he's not going to talk about uh, what is actually causing this to occur, just uh, just that it does, and uh, look at what goes in and one co what comes out. At the entrance of this black box are the stable nucleides. At the exit are also stable nucleides plus energy. In the simplest case, there is one or two nucleides at the input, one or two nucleides at the output, and the number of protons and the number of neutrons uh, at the input is equal to the number of protons and neutrons and the output. Um, this, the article one, uh, which was his work from last year, it discusses this. They did a whole bunch of calculations, uh, and uh, this was provided to the MFMP and uh, with two different programmers last year. This is uh, uh, the excellent Dennis Wimert. He uh, produced this. Uh, uh, very, very easy to use um, system on fuzzfizz.org. We're hosting it on a, a site called fuzzfizz.org. I don't know if you can see that. Maybe I can move that down. Fuzzfizz.org. It's up there. Anyway, it's fuzzfizz.org. And um, essentially, uh, it has uh, the, the considered isotopes, two to two uh, nucleon transfer reactions, fusion reactions, and fission reactions. Uh, but either uh, uh, two to two, two to two, uh, two to one or one to two uh, reactions. Okay, uh, but these don't involve electrons. But anyway, this table was produced, and to give an example, let's say you're starting with um, calcium oxide, and you have some a black box, as he calls it, um, black box to carry out the reaction. The output would be um, uh, helium and iron as the, the most uh, energetically favorable reaction. So he's only considering reactions that produce a net positive energy output. Okay, and you can imagine if this was just the nucleon of oxygen and the nuclei, sorry, the, 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 the core of an oxygen atom and the calcium atom uh, isotope, that this is the core of helium-4 and the core of iron. So this would actually be an alpha, so maybe the alpha would go on to do some other things. And he recognizes that in his work. Uh, because he's saying, but this is not all the possibilities. More than two nuclei can be involved in the processes of this kind. Uh, process uh, involving electrons are also possible. But before we go on to the electrons are also possible, um, another uh, programmer in New Zealand called Philip Power produced this version of the Parkamov tables, uh, which over the course of the year uh, we've enhanced and tried to recognize that um, the reactions aren't just these two to two and so on, and that, that there might be a cascade. So if you imagine there's only two interacting at a particular point in time, that that produces a product, and the product that could then interact with, with another one. So uh, there are cascade reactions here. So uh, these are... Uh, all of the tables reactions. So it, th this would uh, uh, you can either do just fusion reactions, just fission, or two to two, or you can look at all of the tables at once um, uh, here, or you can do cascades. And in cascades, it will actually um, run down. Oh, I haven't got internet on here, so <laughs> uh, but it will run down saying, look, there's a product output, and and uh, those can then uh, do a further reaction. And you can say that, you know, it must be the most energetic reaction that, that goes on to the next uh, cascade. So everything's looking at the most favorable thing. Uh, and what we also did was we put in here uh, properties that you can enter into the SQL uh, uh, query uh, such that um, 
Uh, for instance, you can say, uh, is it very electron negative? Has, does, has it got a high electron negativity or a high electron affinity? Or, for instance, is the product atom uh, uh, in the molten state or will it want to form uh, solid uh, clusters uh, that might drop out of the reaction? So you can analyze your uh, transmutation data and uh, potentially come up with the process uh, by working through this. Uh, the, the, the most recent addition was to uh, add uh, atomic and uh, uh, bosonic nature for an atom and for the nuclei. And uh, I will talk about this in, in future presentations about how this might be uh, uh, relevant and how you might use this to predict uh, uh, good fuels and, and um, uh, outputs uh, from uh, uh, linear reactions um, based on data that uh, was observed of Hutchison's work uh, uh, in Sochi. Uh, so um, he also has a description here. If you go to the uh, notes, he has notes here uh, where he talks about how to uh, work with the various properties and, and, and the timeline of improvement over the course of last year. However, uh, there is circumstances where you seem to have a, an imbalance of uh, um, nucleons. You don't have enough protons. You don't have enough neutrons to, to explain uh, the observables, um, or that may be the case. So what Alexander has done, and I'm, I'm really going to just walk through it. It's a very short uh, little paper, uh, and uh, you'll see uh, why his justification um, uh, for this work is... Uh, he, you'll see his justification for this work. So, as a development of the research in this direction, a calculation was made of possible processes involving electrons and neutrinos. Usually such processes associated with weak interactions are extremely unlikely. But in inverse beta processes, when... Not the emission, but the absorption of electronic neutrinos anti or antineutrinos occurs. The situation is much better. Uh, we can assume uh, the sources of neutrinos and antineutrinos uh, anti issuing beta process. So basically what he's saying is that ordinarily uh, the, the, the likelihood uh, of uh, having interactions involving electrons and, and neutrinos... Uh, uh, these weak interactions uh, are just just not going to happen. However, if it's kind of a reverse process where you've got uh, av availability of neutrinos and antineutrinos, um, uh, this is much uh, more likely. Now, uh, why can he say this with con con uh, confidence? Well, uh, he says that first of all, these are cosmic neutrinos. First of all, they're, so he's talking about the where where the possible neutrinos and antineutrinos can come from. He says first there are cosmic neutrinos of very low energies, relic neutrinos, of which there are a lot of in the cosmos, uh, as shown in three, four, five. So he's referencing three, four, five. These are three, four, five. These are all his work. Now he worked over decades to study. Um, uh, the effect of uh, uh, cosmogenic uh, neutrinos. He is basically the world's expert on this process. And he's saying the interaction of such ultra-cold neutrinos, antineutrinos with matter, is much more efficient than in the case of high-energy neutrinos, antineutrinos, uh, arising, for example, from nuclear reactions in the sun. So he's saying that essentially the cosmic neutrinos, these, these much lower energy neutrinos, are able to interact with matter and cause uh, either electron uh, emission or electron capture uh, into a nucleus. Uh, either um, uh, if you're if you're emitting electron, you're creating a neutron, or if you're uh, a capturing an electron, you are um, basically producing. A, 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 um, sorry, if you're emitting an electron, you're creating a proton. If you're <laughs> capturing an electron, you are. Uh, producing a neutron. So um, this is able to uh, shift the Z number around uh, for your isotope. So, uh, so he's saying basically the, the ones that come from the sun are no good. They basically go straight through the earth and, and, and you know, there is some interactions, but it's not great. Saying so another possible source of ultra low energy neutrinos uh, is the generation of neutrino and antineutrino as a result of processes in a heated substance. For example, electron collisions. If the mass of an electron neutrino is not higher than 0.2 eV, and uh, he's got a reference for that, their birth in a substance with a temperature of several thousand degrees in which there are many particles of kinetic energy of the order of 1 eV is quite possible. So he's basically saying that in his 225-day uh, experiment where we, he was well uh, above 
uh, what was it, 1,700 degrees C. Uh, and actually, it, it doesn't say several thousand degrees. It doesn't say whether that's Kelvin, but, uh, you know, if it was... Uh, Kelvin, then we would be talking about uh, in excess of uh, 2,000, uh, or around about 2,000 degrees C uh, in his 225-day uh, experiment. Uh, he's saying you can produce electron neutrinos. And he's saying it is very important that such neutrinos have a de Broglie, uh, uh, maybe I'm saying that wrong, <laughs> de Broglie uh, wavelength significantly exceeding the interatomic distance, distances. If neutrino mass of 2.2 eV and kinetic energy of 0.1 eV, uh, the de Broglie wavelength is about 5 microns. This means that the interaction region encompasses a huge number of atoms of the order of 10 to the 13 in a solid or liquid substance. Of course, his experiment, the 225-day experiment, was with liquid nickel uh, um, being at the temperature it was which makes transformations spanning many atoms and nuclei possible, with the result that even unlikely processes become noticeable. Note that in the process of inverse beta processes, in contrast to the, uh, to the direct, there is no loss of energy carried away by the emitted neutrinos. We also note that in the case of uh, interaction with the electron uh, nuclei, there is no problem of Coulomb barrier. Now, you know, this guy is the expert. You know, he worked at Rosatom. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to take his word on, on this. Um, but, uh, you know, this, this uh, is very, very important. Uh, it's one of the, uh, uh, the miracles of Lena, as it were. In computer calculation, two types of transformations with the release of energy are considered. So he's, again, only looking at those net positive reactions, either emit an electron or absorb an electron, uh, in which the laws of conservation of electric, baryon, and lepton charges are fulfilled. The black rectangle indicates the obscure physical mechanism of these processes. So, again, he is not concerned with what is going on in the black box. <laughs> this little compressive thing here where the action goes on. He's saying that, uh, you know, you've got your Z numbers here. Uh, so uh, that's the number of protons and this is the atomic number. So A1Z1, A2Z2 plus an electron plus an antineutrino. Uh, they uh, combine uh, with a uh, proton in one of these to give you an extra uh, um, uh, neutron. Uh, we end up with uh, A3Z3 plus A4Z plus plus Q. So uh, essentially saying you start off with these nucleons uh, and you end up with these nucleons uh, and there's a min minus one uh, in terms of uh, protons in uh, one of the Z numbers. Okay, so that is rearranging nucleons with the absorption of electrons. Okay, and then the second case is rearrangement of nucleons uh, with the release of electrons. So uh, essentially, uh, a neutrino is going in, uh, and that is causing uh, the decay of a pro uh, of a, a neutron into. Uh, 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 an electron and uh, a neutron. So a neutrino goes in, uh, causes decay of a, uh, uh, <laughs> a neutron into a proton and electron. And so there we have it. Uh, and uh, so again, you have a, an additional proton. So the Z number of one of the reaction products uh, increases. So uh, in addition, he's done what he did for the first uh, um, sort of fuzz fizz uh, stuff where you have um, uh, the uh, fusion reactions and fission reactions. He's saying special cases of these transformations are synthesis. Two cores are, are transformed into one. So, uh, you know, we might call that fusion. And division, uh, one core is uh, converted into two. Uh, this is fission effectively. But it's it, this is more accurate to say synthesis and division in this case because it's not really fusion and fission directly because you've got the interactions of electrons uh, and neutrinos and antineutrinos. Uh, the computer program found two, 263,546 variants of transformations of the first type of which 1,657 variants of synthesis and 74 variants of division. 
and 433,536 variants of the second type. Wow. Okay, so this combined data set is even bigger than those that are hosted at FUSFIS and that are also now hosted at uh, a new site uh, called Nanosoft. You can't really see that, but it's nanosoft.co.nz uh, for the uh, Philip Power version. Okay. Uh, and uh, he's saying the data are made available. We'll provide a link to the uh, uh, data in the um, description of the video. Uh, and then he goes on to explain uh, the potential products uh, and processes that may be involved uh, with his 225-day uh, uh, reactor. So that is it. Thank you for your time. And um, uh, we are... Uh, looking to work with the programmers of both fuzzfiz.org and uh, nanosoft.co.nz uh, to uh, either integrate or, or, or make a, uh, another uh, interactive uh, database for you to explore the data and to try and predict what are good fuels to use in your Lena reactions. So thank you. Uh, if you like this video, please, uh, uh, you know, say that you like it. And uh, I have noticed that 82% of people watching our videos are not uh, people that are subscribed to our channel. So please consider subscribing to the channel because we're going to have lots of really super interesting videos uh, coming up uh, soon, uh, which uh, will explain or attempt to explain and show data from uh, a lot of different research. So thank you very much for your time.